Thank you, Lord. Baruch Hashem. Thank you, worship team. You know, it's been my honor for almost 40 years to follow the worship team with, and John and Becky were leading it for about 28 years and, and uh, goodness gracious, it's always such an honor to step up in the presence of the Lord while the anointing of God has flooded the place and, and just to be able to share the word of God that he's put on my heart. And I want to just put it out before you. I'm a little nervous, almost like it's my first time to share. And I've been doing this for almost 40 years, but I always want to, I would like to always feel like that and to be passionate about what God's put on my heart to share. And so today, you know, well, let me, let me, everybody pray that this thing works. I don't want to throw it or anything, okay? So let's see what happens. Raising salmon in an ocean of catfish. I don't ever remember putting the title of my message up, but I couldn't help myself today. Raising salmon in an ocean of catfish. And I don't know who did that graphic, but that's really, it wasn't me, but I'm very thankful. And this is kind of to dovetail what Rabbi John has been talking to us about over and over for several weeks into months we've been talking about what do we as believers do? What, what should it look like we're doing out in the world around us that doesn't really believe in what we believe? They don't believe the Bible is the word of God. They don't believe the God of Israel is the God of the universe. And we do believe it. And how do we transmit and convey that truth of this word into our children's lives? You know, the word says we're to go forth in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. And people, if you don't think America is, is crooked and perverse at this point, you're not watching the news. We have strayed so far from the founding fathers and, and so far from the mark that this word sets. And it's very difficult to raise children in the middle of what's going on in the world today. And I, I wonder, well, let's just hold that for a minute. I wonder how many of you have ever been up to Seattle and seen salmon run in the ladder that they made the locks and the ladder were the same. How many of you have ever seen it? Any besides my wife and me? Some. It's it's remarkable. If you go if you go look up on the internet about salmon just themselves, salmon they're just they're amazing. And and where you get to after you read about salmon is you're like, God, you're amazing. The God of creation, the Creator, is just amazing. These salmon go, they go against the stream. It's coming down. They go up. In, in fact, the sockeye salmon, I love to mess with my wife, and she buys salmon every once in a while. And I love salmon, and I said, do you get that knock-eyed? And she said, it's not knock-eyed salmon, it's sockeye salmon. I'm like, whatever. Now I do it just to mess with her. Is that knock-eyed salmon, honey? You know it's sockeye. They, they have they have marked some of these sockeyed salmon. They listen to this. This is just absolutely phenomenal. They start up the locks and they go, they travel as much. Now, this is not all salmon, but these sockeyed salmon, they trail some of them. They go almost 900 miles and they go, are you ready for this? They're against the current. All the catfish are seeing them go up. They're like, what's their problem going upstream? Why, why waste the effort? They, they go not just that far of a distance, they go up to 17,000 feet altitude. They climb up 17,000 feet altitude. It takes weeks and weeks for them. And you know what they're going for? 
to spawn, to lay eggs, and to die. And I thought, God, that's what it's like in this world to raise children in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, to raise children and to try to transmit this. We're, we're trying to, to bring young fish up. We're trying to recreate fish that love God, that will serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that they will learn at a young age to walk with Messiah. And it is very difficult. It is as hard as going up 17,000 feet in altitude in order just to die and lay eggs and die. It's, but, but that's what we're called to do. So I'm kind of dove dovetailing what John's been talking about, how we relate to the society around us. This is not an easy trip. How many of you know that? How many of you have children or grandchildren that are not totally serving the Lord at this point? Some of you are afraid to raise your hands. It might help you if everybody that has a child or a grandchild that's not serving the Lord right now, if you'd raise your hand and look around and see everybody that, look, it's nearly all of us. Why is that? Because it's very difficult and everybody else is looking at you like why do you why do you believe that why do you believe this How, don't you realize that thing's written over thousands of years ago it's antiquated it's old it is the word of the god of abraham isaac and jacob it is the word of the lord and it is the truth and you say richard that's you're being pretty bold. I'm being bold because I used to be one that didn't believe it was the word of truth. And then I met the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he changed my life. And as I told you a few months ago, my, my son told me one time, Dad, do you realize when when God got hold of your life 50 years ago, you changed not just your destiny and mom's destiny, you changed the destiny of your whole family, your children, your grandchildren. This, this thing is, has infected us in a good way. It's just been a remarkable trip. So, so I stand here before you, and I, I like to dovetail the Torah portion. I always like to do that. And so I noticed that we read from the portion that I want to go from today. And you're saying, well, we've already read it. We're not going to, we're going to look back at it for just a minute. And I'll tell you why. I struggle with this portion. When John told me a couple of months ago, Dad, can you, could you minister on July the 9th? And I said, well, sure I can. And I went home that day and I looked at Chukat. The parasha was named Chukat. And it means a statute of, a statute of chukat. And I thought, okay, let's see. And I started reading through the Torah portion because I like to dovetail the Torah portion. And I just want to be transparent today. I struggled with it. I read one thing and I thought, God, I, I don't understand that. Now, I didn't say it out loud, but... You know, some of us think if we don't say it out loud, God won't know it. Oh, please. <laughs> the psalmist said he knows the words in our mouth before we even speak them. He knows what we think. He knows our thoughts. So I might as well be honest, I thought, and just go ahead and say it. Lord, I don't understand this. I mean, the first thing was about the red heifer, the ashes of the red heifer. I read through it, and I'm like, I wish you could be a fly on the wall and see some of the discussions my wife and I have because I'm like, honey, I don't get it. And she said, and she looks up a rabbinic commentary and she said, well, this, and then she looked up a Christian theologian and she said, well, th this is what they say. And I said, well, which one's right? How do I know they're right? It, it doesn't, it's not clear in the word. I don't understand it. She said, well, you can't stand up and tell people you don't understand something. I have to, I don't understand it. I'm like, and then I go to the next thing, and it's about, it's Moshe and Aharon, and God tells them, don't, he, don't hit the rock this time. One time they had hit the rock earlier, and water gushed out. But God said, speak to the rock. And most of you are familiar with it. I read through it, and I'm like, 
there I go again. I'm thinking something, and I don't want to say anything, but I'm like, God, I, I get it that, that you told them to, to speak to the rock, and they hit the rock. And, and I know they disobeyed, but Lord Moshe, he's your servant. He brought the children out. He's led them for 40 years. He's your servant. You won't let him go into the promised land just because that one time he disobeyed? I'm like, God, I just don't understand it. I, uh, you're God. Listen, I, 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 don't, I don't question God in the sense of, I don't get it. What do you do? I, I, I've got enough fear of God in me that I don't talk to God like that. But I, I, in my mind, I'm saying I don't understand it. Then I went to the, to the next thing, and that was the, the portion that I think we read earlier. I believe that's what's going to come up. And, um, yeah, when the Canaanite king, you can just follow on. We're going to read back through this, and there's a reason I want to read back through it. When the Canaanite king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming along the road to Atharim, he attacked Israel and captured some of them. Then Israel vowed to Adonai and stated, if you deliver this people into our hand, we will put their cities under the ban of destruction. Adonai listened to Israel's plea. He delivered up the Canaanites. They put them in their cities under the ban of destruction, so the name of the place was called Hormah. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Sea of Reeds in order to go along around the land of Edom. The, the spirit of the people became impatient along the way. Everybody say, uh-oh. The, the spirit of the people became impatient along the way. The people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us from Egypt to die in the wilderness? Because there's no bread, no water. Our very spirits detest the despicable food. So Adonai sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against Adonai and you. Pray to Adonai for us that he may take away the snakes. So Moses prayed for the people. Then Adonai said to Moses, Make yourself a fiery snake, put it on a pole. Whenever anyone who has been bitten will look at it, he or she will live. So Moses made a bronze snake, put it on a pole, and it happened that whenever a snake bit anyone and he looked at the bronze snake, he lived. And I read that, and I thought, you know, Lord, I'm, I think this is where I'm supposed to dovetail, but I don't. I don't understand something about this. Lord, I've always presented it. It's been black and white in my theological thinking. I've always presented to the people that if you sin and you get out of righteousness in the eyes of God, that, that he removes his hand from you and the devil comes in and is free to attack you. Now, that was the way I've kind of I taught it so many times that that's kind of my main way of thinking about it. You sin, you don't do what God says to do. God removes his hand of protection and the enemy comes in. But I said, God, this doesn't say that. This is very clear. This says you sent the snakes. I, I, Lord, I'm struggling with this whole parasha, but this, and I'm struggling with this. And I'm sitting there and I'm just, just having a little conversation with the Lord. I'm having a, I, I love, to, I get up before my wife nearly every day for a couple of hours and just have some time with God, quiet time. And I'm sitting there talking with the Lord and I'm saying, Lord, I'm struggling over this. And I'm not, I don't want to wax too spiritual, but it's like I sense the Spirit of God saying, what did you do when your two children went next door to a new house that was being built and they took brand new bricks and they threw them down in the middle and they were breaking the bricks the brand new bricks they were breaking them and you caught it and you came out and you caught them what did you do and I thought for a minute and I said I brought the snakes <laughs> I, I remember saying to my two kids my son doesn't even remember it God must have erased it from his memory. That's good. Do you remember it? My daughter remembers it. 
I said, get in this house right now. And the snake was in the form of a belt. And it, and it, <laughs> it's like, I, I remember spanking him. And, 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 and I'm sitting there thinking about it. And, and God, uh, that same voice says, did you love your children? I said, God, you know I love my children. We had a time of it. My wife and I, you said you bring a man and a woman together to bear righteous seed. And, I, and I, I, for 30 minutes, I was lost in raising my children and, and all the fun we had and, and the times when we would, when they were real little, we'd give them a bath and I would take a towel and I'd wrap it around them and I'd pull them out and hold them up in the air and they would giggle and I'd giggle and Patsy would say, put them down. And it, it's, it, we, we just had, there was the time on the road trip, we had a, a, a station wagon and from the driver's side, you could push one button and the back door, you had to be in park, you had to be stopped. The back door of the, would go down and, uh, under the floorboard and if you push the other button, the window would come up and you'd have wide open, you had to be stopped. So we're on a trip one time. How many of you love the trips with your children in the back? You know, it's about a five and a half hour trip. And we had gone about, uh, well, my son was famous for get, getting to the first town and say, are we there yet? I'm like, we've gone 20 minutes, Rick, just calm down. And so we'd been going for a couple of hours and the kids were just having, they're in the back and there's a seat in between us. We can't reach them, I can't hit them and we're, we're going along and 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 they're just they're getting a little louder and you know I know you, none of y'all did this but I had the tendency to the level of my voice y'all quit that you know that's not going to do anything then y'all quit that dad did it for a little bit but not and so so I had gone up to the last level stop it now and they're they're trying to, but within minutes, they're giggling and running. So I pull the car off the road, and I put one window up and the back door down, and I got out of the car, and it got, it was, when I pulled off and stopped, and the windows went up, and the, it got very quiet. And I walked to the back, and I climbed in with them, and I said, Patsy, you drive. We're going to play back here. And we started, if you think it was loud with just the two of them, the three of us, Patsy felt like she raised three children and I was one of them. And so I, I'm sitting there thinking about, I'm like, Lord God, how I love my children. I don't know how to do much, but uh, Lord, you helped us to raise children. And it was, you know, people would tell us, when you, you better be ready. You better enjoy them now because when they get to be teenagers, listen, I'm sorry but I'd like to stand against that and because when, my, when our children got to be teenagers, they turned into a young woman and a young man of God, and they became our best friends just about. Now, I, we were still the parents, and they respected us as such, but raising children has just been a trip. If my son was here, I'd say along with my daughter, uh, y'all were the Y'all were just the best I've ever seen. It was such a, I said, Lord, you know I love my kids. And, 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 I, and, I'm, and I'm like, God is reminding me, you punished them when they did wrong. You had to. That's the way they learn. And, and so I got to thinking about, Lord, is we, what did we do when people say, how did y'all raise children like that? We're like, it's the grace of God. I don't, I can't, I can't really tell you. I, I tell them we like to have fun with them, but we discipline them when we need to. I don't know what, and then I thought the other day when I was thinking about this, I thought, you know, there is one thing that we tried to do with our children. We tried to, I mean, you want to transmit your faith to them, but you can't force it. If you tried that, that doesn't work. They'll, they'll, nobody wants to be forced into believing something or doing something. And so we just kind of told them at a young age, 11, 12, 13, 14, we told them, y'all are going to have to develop your own relationship with God. But all their life, we told them, listen, mom and I have decided we're going to live by the word of God. And therefore, we're not going to be like the rest of the world. And we tried to, to 
instill in our children that we're not better than anybody, but we're going to follow the word of the Lord to the best of our ability. And when we do, it's going to separate us from the rest of the world a lot of times. And you're going to have to stand up and do things that, that are hard. It's hard. You know why it's so hard, people? I think this is my next slide. No. It's going to be after that. I'll just go ahead and tell you, and we'll see it when it comes up. It's hard because peer pressure is brutal. How many of you know peer pressure is brutal? It's terrible when, thank you, sis. It's, it's brutal. And, and it's, it makes life hard. It makes it hard. It makes it almost impossible at times to serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because People will mock you. People will make fun of you. You know, you know what a lot of people do to, to disciple believers? You know, I know this is the truth. I, I've heard it. You know what they do to disciple young men growing up? They say, listen, you can't just be that different. You, in order to get, win the world, you got to mix in a little with them. You, gotta, you have to cuss a little. You have to drink a little because they... God, for who, where is that but out of the pit of Sheol itself? Uh, listen, I got permission to share this from a father-in-law, but I thought that's close enough. I have a granddaughter that married a guy that's a pastor of a congregation in Phoenix. And I, Patsy and I met the guy. We've talked with him. We've gotten to know him better and better. We were there for the wedding, and we've been on a ski trip with them. And I saw this guy, and when we came home, I told my wife, I said, boy, he's a different breed. This was before they married. I said, he's a different breed of a guy. He is so set. I mean, he's known what he was going to do for years. He, he. God trained that young man. His parents helped train him. He is one of the best pastors I've seen, one of the most dedicated men of God I've ever seen. And, and his dad told my son just within the last week, he said, when we were raising Caden, he said, you don't know how many Friday nights he would cry or he would be angry because all of his friends were out doing stuff and he wouldn't do it and he said you don't know how many times Ricky I went and I said son you listen to me I know it's hard I know what you're doing is hard but it's going to pay dividends in your life when you become what God wants you to be it's going to pay dividends it's going to bring an anointing of God that you you won't believe and it did and and this boy with the, the peer pressure he he wept. He was so lonely on Friday nights because everybody else was out partying, but he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. People, that's the kind of dedication it takes. And, and so, so I, I want to take you through a quick trip real quickly. And I don't know if I go back while I get to the John, uh, John 12. That's just to show some before I do it, look, I go back one. Oh, can't do it. Okay, look, before I do this, let me just set the stage. I tried to think, God, where could I tie the Torah portion in and put it all together? And they did it with the reading of the new covenant. But I just want to take a minute, a little bit of time, just to go through chapter three. We read from chapter three of John earlier. And it says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, or that's the way the complete Jewish Bible says it, or Nicodemus as we know him in Texas. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jewish people. This man wasn't just a Jewish man. He was a ruler of the Jewish people. He was a Judean leader. And, and we don't have time to go into it. I'll leave it for John. I would love to hear John just take this beyond where I can go with it. But listen, 
if you read through the book of Yohanan John, the good news of Messiah, you're going to see there was a rift in Judaism. Of course, it wasn't just between the Judean Jews and the Galileans and the secular Jews and the rest. There were, there were Essenes, there were Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, Zealots. There were different sects of Jewish people doing different things and into this God sends the Messiah. But this was a Pharisee named Nicodemus that came out and, and most of you don't think about this when you read it. It says he came out to Yeshua at night and he said unto him, Rabbi, we know you're come from God. Nobody can do what you're doing unless God be with him. And Yeshua says, I tell you the truth, Nicodemus, unless a man or a woman get born again, they won't see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says, get born again? How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Yeshua said, Nicodemus, listen, I tell you the truth. Unless a man is born of the water, that's a natural birth, and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't marvel it, I said unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wants to, and you hear the sound thereof, but you can't tell where it came from or where it's going. So is everyone born of the spirit. And Nicodemus answered and said to him, Rabbi, how can these things be? And Yeshua said, are you a, are you a rabbi in Israel? You don't know these things? If I've told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how are you going to believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And listen to this, for God did not send his, send his Son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world. Listen, people, if, if, if you want to walk with God, at some point, you, you have to get born of the Spirit of God. I, I, I hear derogatory statements, born again, what does that mean? Well, go look at the Word of God. Yeshua explains that you've got to, it's not enough to be born in the natural, to have a mama who her water breaks and you're born in the natural. You've got to be born of the Holy Spirit at some point in your life. And, 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 Listen, Beth Messiah and people that are watching online and everybody in this auditorium. Some people, some people come very slowly into the kingdom of God, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's been a Jewish guy that came to Beth Messiah for the last three years, and three weeks ago, he gave his heart. He just, nobody coerced him, nobody forced him, nobody, we, nobody pressured him. We just loved him. That's what we do. We love people. We love each other, we love God, and we love people. And three weeks ago, the man gave his heart to Yeshua, and he said, I wanna, I, I've seen Yeshua in y'all. I want him in my life. This is a Jewish man that grew up in the synagogue. But, and, and he came slowly but surely toward the light of Messiah and came into the kingdom. But other people, just it takes a, a traumatic event in their life or something to come to faith. And I know in my own life, I'd been in a congregation for 20 years, a certain denominal, denominational congregation, and in another one for six. I'd been 26 years, and I'd been in a congregation every week of my life. And I was married for six years. And I befriended a little kid across the street from where I worked. His name was Ricky. And my wife and I knew we were going to have a son named Ricky at some point. And so I just naturally gravitated toward this boy. He was seven years old. His daddy had left the house. The mother was working herself silly, trying to take care of four kids. The dad had just left. And I love this boy. He had never been in school. He, he didn't have books. He didn't have, his mother didn't have time to get him in school. He was seven. So I took him to the elementary school, and I, I got him books. I got him enrolled. I got a bike that was a secondhand bike. And, and I, 
I got him all ready to go, and he, he got into school, and he was so excited. He was there with kids his age and, and, and beginning to learn. And so we, God called us to leave Houston and go up to Stephenville. And I, I say called us. We did it, but I see how God was behind it now. And the day we got up to St Stephenville, the next morning we went to unload the truck. And before I could unload it, my mom came over from their house. My mom and dad lived up there. And, and she said, you've got to come back to the house. Y'all don't have a phone, but somebody's called an emergency to call. So I go and I call the office where I used to work. And she says, the, the lady that had called me from my office, she said, Richard, I'm, you need to sit down. And I'm like, I'm sitting. And she said, little Ricky went out to play near the railroad tracks right behind his house, and, it, and he fell underneath, and it cut him in two, and he's dead. All I could do was give the phone to my wife. You want to take the mic? Because I feel like I'm reliving it. It just... It just shattered my religious thinking, my all my theology, and and I got within a month because see, my wife and I had lost twenty three hundred dollars. It was all we had back then. We lost twenty three hundred dollars on a house here in Houston. We moved up there. We had nothing. We were back to zero. We didn't know anybody anything. We don't like to owe people anything, and so. All the way up moving, I kept bad mouthing, saying, Patsy, I can't believe we lost $2,300. We lost $2,300. And the next day I find out little Ricky has lost his life. And, and it's like <laughs> the Spirit of God says, What do you think is really important? And so it catapulted me. Sometimes, you know, there was an old song, a gospel song that says, Sometimes it takes a mountain. Sometimes a troubled sea, sometimes it takes a desert to get a hold of me. Your love is so much stronger than anything that troubles me. Sometimes it takes a mountain to trust you and believe. People, that's sometimes it takes something, some a tragedy or something, something to shake us and wake us up, and we get born again. We we come and we say, God, I'm a mess. I've I've lived as a hypocrite. I'd lived as a hypocrite for 26 years. People that knew me said, Whoa, he's a fine believer. I didn't have any more idea of a personal relationship with God than the man in the moon. Because there is no man in the moon. But people come to faith. Sometimes they're catapulted into faith. Sometimes they just slide into faith. But they, you've got to be born again. I got born again when I was 26 years old. That was years ago. That was a long, it was 50 years ago. 50 years ago, I got born again. And it, and it, it changed the destiny of my life and my whole family. And so... I've got a, a few minutes left, and I want to tell you, so what do you do after you get born again? What do you do after you get born of the Spirit of God? So in John chapter 3, after Yeshua tells them to get born again, they, the word is very clear that you start a process of discipleship. You begin to grow in the Word of God. I gotta quit crying. Listen, people, please hear the heart of God in this today. You are, when you when you put your trust in Yeshua, the blood of Messiah is over the doorpost of your life, just like the Jewish children back in Egypt. They put the blood of the Lamb over the doorpost of their lives. Were they more righteous than the Egyptians? No. They prove that by going out in the desert and sinning against God and breaking commandments out in the, after they received the Torah. They broke, 
nobody's perfect. Nobody's without sin. That's why we need to come to the Messiah. They put the blood, the only thing that protected them that night when the death angel came was the blood of the lamb over the door of their home. You are no more justified 50 years after you've accepted Yeshua than you are the day you accept him. You can't get any more justified in the eyes of God. The only thing that justifies you is not how many good works you've done. Well, I'm not afraid to stand before God because I've honored the Sabbath and I've given to the poor and I've got to. Listen, it will not save you. That's why they, Israel had a temple to do blood atonement for sin. And that's why even though Israel doesn't have a temple for the last 2,000 years, it's why the blood of Messiah is eternal in the heavens. And it's, it, makes, it justifies us in the sight of God. You can't get any more justified, but you can get sanctified. And that is so important. Listen to what my friend O.C. says about sanctification, okay? This is so important. It doesn't... Do you, well, let me read it. Let me, let me say it to you. And then we'll, we'll, the last line will give it away. It says, Every part of our human nature which is not brought into subjection to the Holy Spirit after we've received deliverance from sin will prove to be a corrupting influence. We are not delivered from human nature. Human nature was created by God, not by the devil. It may be weak and infirmed, it may be old and feeble, but it's not sinful. The first creation retains the remnants of God's handiwork. The recreation is the building up of a spiritual habitation within us, which the scriptures refer to as sin. And the new creation formed within us. Everybody say the new creation formed within us. If we don't learn to submit our natural life into that new creation, which God calls the habitation of God, if we don't learn to submit our natural life in sanctification and obedience to the Holy Spirit and the new creation formed in us, you know what happens? Our profession will become a disgusting hypocrisy. If do you, do you hear the heart of what God's saying through Oswald? He says that, that if you get born again and the Spirit of God comes into you and you never get into the Word of God to be discipled, to get sanctified through that process of sanctification and obedience, if you don't do it, at some point your people will look at you and your profession of faith in Yeshua will become a disgusting hypocrisy because you're, you're doing the same things now that you did then you you haven't changed something's something you got the wrong end of the stick if that's your testimony if you're still doing the same things now if you're still cussing like you cussed and drinking and wobbling on i don't want to go and if you're still doing if you're in sexual immorality if you how did yeshua come in and change your life yeshua said i didn't just come to forgive you i came to change your life and people there's a, you know, sometimes we read the Word of God and we just read past things and they're golden nuggets. They're, they're like diamonds in the rough and we just read by them and, and we, we don't get it. And so I just wanted to, I just wanted to tell you one place in, in 2 Peter, Simon Shimon Kepha, he says to those, it, it, whereby are given unto us, and I think I have this down, but I'll say it first. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness love. For if you do these things, the so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the kingdom of God. Listen, and some of you think, well, you're going to talk about adding to your faith virtue. No, no, the nugget, the nugget was, and this is the way people ask, well, how does it work? If I'm born again, the Spirit of God, how does the sanctification work? What Peter tells us in a short phrase, 
And he says, exceeding, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Everybody say that with me. Exceeding great and precious promises. That by these, by these what? Exceeding great and precious promises. That by these you might become partakers of the divine nature. That's, that's just a, it's not even a whole verse whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might become partakers of the divine nature. The way you develop the habitation of God in your life is you take the promises of God. And are there a lot of promises of God? He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Yeshua said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. My Father will love you. We will come unto you. We'll make our dwelling place in you. That's a promise. You look, the Word of God is full of promises for the people who want to walk with him. And it's full of promises. And, and Shimon Kepha, Simon Peter says, the way you get God in your life is you become partakers of the divine nature because you look at those promises that are in the Word of God. And I, I close out with another one of my friends, and this is very, this is very important. Listen to this, and he'll tell us how the process works because this is an insight that I would have never seen without him. Oswald is commenting on the time that Paul, Rabbi Paul, got in prison and he and he got set free from prison. He got stoned. He was stoned. And, and it, it, there was a time when they were seeking his life. The king of the country had sent uh, some soldiers to apprehend him. And Paul, they says they let Paul out a window in a basket beyond the wall and he escaped. They were there to kill him. And so so here's what uh, Oswald's commenting on that, what happened. And he says, but we had the sentence, this, this is from 2 Corinthians. Paul says, listen, I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the trouble that came to me in Asia, how we were pressed beyond measure above strength. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver in whom we trust, he will yet deliver us. You also helping together with your prayers for us. Paul, Paul says, we had the sentence of death. We were dead if God didn't deliver us. And here's what Oswald says about it. He's commenting on it. He says, if I'm in fellowship with the Messiah Yeshua, and I have fellowship with him, then I have the sentence of death in myself, and nothing the world, the flesh, or the devil can do will touch me. This light of divine revelation came to Paul out of his desperate experience in Ephesus. He knew then and there that nothing could ever again scare him. Listen to this. The discipline of his fellowship with Messiah brought about through Paul's experience the assimilation of what he believed. We say many things that we believe, but they've never been tested. The discipline of our fellowship with Messiah has to work through all the things that we believe and in in, to turn them into real spiritual nuggets. It's the trial of your faith that's so precious. Hold on to God against all odds until he turns your spiritual beliefs into real possessions. So people, you're saying, well, I'm still, not, I'm still not quite there, Richard. Look, I want to ask you something about Paul, Shaul of Tarsus, a Jew of Jews. He, he brags in a humble way, he brags and says, listen, don't think you're any more Jewish than me. I was raised under the feet of Gamaliel. I was out persecuting Jews that said they believe in Yeshua. I was a Jew of Jews. I was pleasing the Sanhedrin. I was doing what I thought God wanted me to do until he knocked me down that day. But my, my question to you is, before God saved Paul's life the first time, whether it was when he was stoned or when he was out in the deep at night in the day, you go read through 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and you'll see all the times Paul was let down the window in a basket, all the times that God delivered him. But before the first one happened, do you think Paul had ever heard of Psalm 91? 
Psalm 91 had been written anywhere from 800 to 1,000 years before Paul lived on the earth. Do you think he knew Psalm 91? He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Surely He'll deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. He will cover me with His feathers and under His wings I will trust. His truth shall be a shield and buckler to me. I'll not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the error that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand could fall at my side, ten thousand at my right hand. It will not come near me. Only with my eyes shall I behold and see the reward of the wicked, because I have made the Lord, who is my refuge, the Most High. There shall no evil befall me, neither shall any plague come near my dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over me to keep me in all my ways. They They'll bear me up in their hands lest I dash my feet against the stone. I will trample upon the lion and the adder, the young lion, the dragon. I'll trample under feet. Because he set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life while I satisfy him and show him my Yeshua, my salvation. Do you thank you, Lord, for your work? Do you think, do you think Rabbi Paul had I bet he could quote it a lot better than I ever dreamed of quoting it, and he did it in Hebrew. But until he believed it, he said it, but until God delivered him from death, he didn't own it. People, you and I say many things that we believe, but they've never been tested. You don't own it until God takes you through the trial and the fire. And when, you, when he brings you out on the other side, it's, it's gotten from here to here where God lives inside of you. And that's what I want for Beth Messiah. I want you to be born of the Spirit of God, but I don't want you to just stop. That's just the open door into the kingdom of God. There's a process of sanctification where you get more and more one with God and where you end up 50 years later and I can tell you, I'm not perfect, but I don't do what I used to do. If you knew me then and you knew me now, you'd say, well, your God, <laughs> if he can do that with you, he can do that with me. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your mercy and grace over us today. Lord, you know my heart. I, I, I want to see people come to believe in Yeshua because he is the Mashiach. He is Ben Elohim Chaim. He is the son of the living God. Lord, flesh and blood cannot reveal that to people. Only your spirit can do that. So I'm asking for the Holy Spirit just to, just to open the eyes of people today that are watching online, that are here. Lord, open our eyes that being born again is a great first step and we won't get any more justified in your eyes because of the blood of Yeshua. But, Lord, your perfect will is that we grow in grace and in the knowledge of your word and that we become mature disciples, walking it out with you day by day, letting you pick us up when we fall and forgive us and keep us moving. Lord, I pray today that if you're dealing with anybody here online in the sanctuary, that, that they would just open up their heart to you. But that's the only way they'll be able to see the kingdom of God. And I pray it in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen.